Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tech Tactics Live. This is episode 66. If you haven't noticed, we're not in the PCA garage. We're actually in Easton, Pennsylvania, at Porsche's National uh, Eastern Training Center and Distribution Center. And it's great to have a live audience. You're not allowed to throw anything at me or make fun of me. Uh, well, the good news is I'm not going to be speaking very much in this episode. We're going to go straight into it. I know we were a little bit late in getting started, so I apologize to those of you that were waiting online. But I guarantee you, it was, it was well worth the wait, and um, we're going to bring on our next speaker, F shoes and all, today. Uh. <laughs> no flip-flops. That's an inside joke for those of you that are watching online. Uh, Nathan Burrs. Uh, so many hats that he wears for PCA, uh, being on the tech committee with valuation, owner of Columbia Valley Luxury Cars, my very good friend, one of my best friends, someone that I rely on all the time. Nathan Merz today is going to talk about online Porsche inspections. And before we turn it over to him, we have to thank Pirelli, our sponsor of Tech Tactics Live. And of course, thank you to Porsche Cars North America for allowing us to have this event live here today and tomorrow. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Actually, those of you in the audience, if you want to follow along on your phone, you can as well. We will be taking questions later from the audience here. If you have a question, speak up. I'll repeat it, and then you'll answer it. And then I will also be monitoring the live chat, so questions from the audience online. I'll be looking at those, and with that, I turn it over to you, Nathan. Well, thank you, Vu. Is everyone having a good day so far? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, for those of you guys who go to church, there's always like people like to hide in the back, but feel free, there's seats up here. It's not a comedy show. I won't heckle anybody at the front or make fun of you, so uh, feel free to file in, make a seat. Um, today, we're going to be doing something kind of fun. I know a lot of people like to talk about the online auction environment. It's been kind of a radical change in our world. Uh, now you can watch cars be auctioned live time. Uh, a lot of people think just about bringing a trailer. There's, there's lots of online auctions out there. Uh, but we'll be dealing with a couple auctions that are currently live on Bring a Trailer. So who did their homework and took a look at the couple auctions that we're going to be? Oh, good. Well, it'll be interesting to see what you guys see versus what I see. And we're going to have some discussions around that. So uh, let's get this thing started off. They cut my time short, and I'm a talker. So we'll try to make this work. Okay, again, if you don't know who I am, I'm on the National Tech Committee, so if you call PCA and say, what's my car worth, you get me, for good or bad, for your $48 membership dues or $46, that's about the value you get out of me, I guess. Uh, you'll find me in Pano, I also write for a magazine called Avance, uh, I do these Tech Tactics events, as well as a lot of our YouTube content. Make Vu happy and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have not, that's all that guy says every day, every day, subscribe to YouTube. So. Uh, it's a great channel. Um, I do a lot of consulting in the market on uh, trends, vehicle values, uh, assessing cars uh, for various you know, auction houses, insurance companies. I even get involved in fun litigation when people fight over what cars are worth. Never fun. Um, I do own a dealership in Seattle called Columbia Valley Luxury Cars. And like many of you, I'm just a lifelong Porsche fanatic. I bought my first 911 when I was 16 and have kind of had 911s and Porsches in my life ever since. So that's a little bit about who I am. Let's get this started. So our goal today, we're going to uh, very quickly decide whether a car merits further consideration. So we're going to look, what do, what do we see both in the ad copy, in the photos, as well as the commentary. We're going to talk about how to tease out clues in photos and ad copy, because believe it or not, they won't tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> Mind blown, right? Uh, we're going to talk about what red flags when you look at an auction, are there red flags? Things I should say, mm, do not proceed forward. I tell you all the time, customers will come in and they'll tell me, oh, I bought this car at an auction. And it came off the truck, and as soon as the door opened, I knew I was had, right? <laughs> and I'm like, so then I'll look at the auction, I'm like, okay, didn't this seem obvious? They're like, well, I got kind of excited, and this guy named Joe Bob 77 said it was a great car. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Joe, right? right? Okay. Um, what about those online experts? We have a lot of online experts in the, in the market today. Uh, one of the reasons I started doing a lot of the YouTube content and some of these things is I was getting really frustrated because so much information I found out there was just wrong. And when there was a dearth of information, some online expert would simply make it up. Well, actually, Porsche, because of high humidity content in the part of Stuttgart, they, I'm like, 
that's not even true. But they would just make this crap up, right? So it's one of the reasons I like to do some of this stuff is just try to dispel some of the myths that are out there. Okay. I want to start with a few caveats. We are going to be talking about two cars that are actually live currently on Bring a Trailer. I lost a little bit of sleep on here because I, I'm a kind of a, I like to think of myself as a nice person. So we're going to keep it really professional. We're not going to attack any seller or make any comment that's derogatory or could impact the auction. So we're just going to keep it that way. But we're just going to talk about what we see. So that's one caveat there. Um, these are just best practices. They're not infallible, right? I always tell you to get an in-person inspection. Believe it or not, if you click on my profile on BAT, which is my initial CVLC, you can see me. You can see what I've bought on there. And I can tell you, the only car I've ever bought on BAT that I haven't inspected was a, a, a 1989 Honda CRX SI I bought to relive my childhood. It was 15 grand. I figured if it's not what it's supposed to be, it's 15 grand. But I bought some other pretty notable cars, and I travel and go and look at the cars. In fact, there's a car on BAT right now. I'm probably going to drive 90 miles north of here tonight to go inspect because I'm kind of interested in it. And so I believe you should look at what you're, what you're buying, OK? Um, a really savvy seller can hide most of the things, but thankfully, they're rare, right? Most sellers trip up somewhere, right? So they try to be kind of lead you astray. There's usually some clues. Your job is to look for them, right? Um, the other thing is buying any used Porsche has risk. The key is reducing your risk. If you want to live in a risk-free environment, I have a perfect answer for you. It's called Toyota. <laughs> now, you may need some mental health counseling after you've driven it for a year. But if you want risk-free ownership, Toyota. It actually sounds nice to say Toyota, right? It's a perfectly good product, not denigrating at all. If you just need an appliance to toast your bread, it does that perfectly, OK? Porsches break. Oh my gosh, heaven forbid. OK. Couple things to know about online auctions. This is something that's so obvious, but amazing how many people don't know this. The auction does no due diligence. None. None whatsoever. The only thing that they do when you submit your car is they ask you for a copy of the title. That's it. 100% of the information that they have is what is submitted by the seller. So if the seller is very forthcoming, you have a very forthcoming auction. If the seller is not, you don't. Right? Think about that. There, there's no other involvement on the auction, okay? The other thing is the distancing language makes this clear, right? It's like as if they consulted an attorney. You'll notice they'll say, seller states, believed to be, right? So everything that's a claim in there always has distancing language. So if, if something comes back to them, they say, well, the seller stated that. We didn't, right? So pay attention to that. Um, the other thing that's really, really important for people to understand is they are not true auctions, right? Well, what does that mean? It's called an auction, but it's really not. Because what a real auction does is an auction would be an intermediary. So I'll give you an example. If you're selling your house, you have a real estate agent, and then when you have a deal come together, then you meet at the escrow company, right? You never meet that person who's buying your house, right? Someone else handles all that paperwork and financing and all that stuff. With one of the online auctions, what happens is when you win the auction, or if you're the seller, you have a buyer, you simply get an email. And it says, your buyer is John Smith. Here's his phone number, his email. Good luck. They've already been paid. They already swiped that credit card. They got their $5,000 or whatever it was. And they're out. So what they really are is the world's most expensive, very hot lead generation source. Well, this is really important because some people don't know that when they run a car for sale. Because what happens when this happens is, let's say Joe Bob is your high, but high bidder, right? You get his email, and you send him an email. And his response is like, oh, great. I'm really excited about the car. Next month, my brother-in-law is buying my 69 Camaro. And when the funds come in, I'll pay you. Oh, wait a minute. Or great, uh, I have a buddy down the road. He's going to come look at the car. Uh, would you take my wood chipper and my 45 as a tra partial trade for it? You guys laugh, but this stuff happens, right? The auction's already done. So just understand it's a different offering than a traditional auction like that, OK? Um, the other thing is they will not involve themselves in the transaction. So they are not going to work on your behalf, either as the buyer or the seller, right? They're already paid. They're out. The most they'll ever do is, if, like, for example, a buyer doesn't buy your car. Um, they'll generally offer to let you relist it for free, Woohoo! the 99 bucks, right? They'll generally do that, and they may ban the user, potentially. 
But then the user just creates a new username with a new credit card and off they go, right? Okay? Um, the other thing that's really important for people to know, because a lot of people put a lot of faith in these things, is believe it or not, the comments are moderated. This is a really important thing to know. Now, it's kind of obvious because if someone's using hate speech or saying really horrible things, they have to have the right to moderate to some degree. But there's always a line. What is appropriate moderation? So, for example, if a commentator has a comment which maybe the seller perceives as negative towards them, where's the line between it being dangerous or attacking and just being something the seller doesn't want to hear? Right? So don't assume all the comments are out there or really contain all the body of potential concerns about the car. Uh, some of the online auctions, without naming some of them, are more egregious about this than others. Some of them are really aggressive about moderating any comments they don't like. So just be careful with that, okay? Uh, and again, just so you guys know, I'm a fan of these auctions. Like, I have a car running. I have an already R8. If anyone wants an R8, feel free to bid. It's running no reserve right now. Um, but just be aware of what's going on. Um, you're no safer buying in this format than another. A lot of people say to me, oh, I felt good about buying this car because, again, Joe Bob, he's a real expert, and he told me that's, those are the right uh, wheel covers for that car. Okay, well, do we know who Joe Bob is, right? Just assume you're no safer than in any other environment. Um, and then again, again, inspect what you expect. That was loud. Okay. So, who did their homework here? A lot of us? Okay. We're going to do some hands-on examples. So the first car we picked is a 1996 993 Cura 4S Coupe. Uh, this car is ending in just a few hours. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do live time is we don't necessarily have all the answers. Some people say, well, you could do an auction that already ended. And I said, well, that's not as much fun because then all the information's out there. We want to see, you've pulled up this listing, what questions should you be asking? What concerns might you have? So, before I go into anything, uh, give me one person, give me your thought about this car so far. Right back there. Yep, the C4S. Oh, I guess you'll repeat his question or his comment. Okay. Okay. Who's got any feedback on this car and they looked at it? Accident reported. So they've noticed that there's accident reported for this vehicle. Okay. We'll be talking about that. Huh? Um, says service records back to 1997. Service records back to 1997. You guys are on it. What else do we have? Anything else? One more thing. Okay, we're going to go with the car facts and service records. So let's jump into what I noticed about this auction and what's sort of interesting. Okay. So we're not going to take any time to review this because you guys have already done this, but basically, a couple things I'm going to tell you guys to do. Read the ad copy carefully. Remember, the ad copy is written by the auction company, not by the seller. So if you list a car, they'll send you the proposal. You can give them feedback, but they don't take a lot of it. <laughs> because again, they want that distancing language. And they try not to use kind of broad, euphemistic terms like perfect and things like that, okay? Which is fair. Um, review the photos carefully, right? A lot of people have told me, they've, they've literally, I have customers tell me they've bought a car on their phone while they're on the subway or something. I'm like, get at your desk with a nice high-res monitor and really, you're going to spend this kind of money. Don't be stupid. Come on. Okay. Um, review the comments. What questions are being asked versus what questions aren't being asked? How is the seller responding? How's the, how's the environment here? Um, are the commentators acting not something different? Potentially. Not necessarily saying that's true. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing it says, the Carfax report shows the aforementioned 1997 accident entry and list snapping photos, right? Okay. Um, there are some key photos that are missing, however, right? We have no chassis photos, so we don't see underneath the car. That's really important. Um, we don't have any photos of the engine without the undertrace. I can't really see the engine if it's covered, right? Um, I also don't see a couple of the, uh, the known wear issues on 993s like the cowl, which is prone to rust. Um, and I also don't see photos, for example, of the door checks. Things I would want to see. So that might be questions I might ask the seller. Um, response and you putting them on public blast. It's just rude, right? Now, if they won't respond, or, I know that it is not easy if you don't have access to a hoist, but it sure would give us potential buyers more confidence that there are no oil leaks or other things to worry about. Very fair, right? The seller would serve themselves well to provide this information, right? 
And then the last question is, any info on the accident in 1997? I realize it was before your ownership, right? This is key. But perhaps the previous owner passed along some info or you've seen some evidence. So he's giving them the opportunity to try to expand on this. So now let's look at how the seller is responding. Um, and again, I, I think my general impression as a seller really is trying to be honest. He's working with the information he has. I mean, that's my overall impression. Um, his first comment is, it was part of a much larger collection for 15 years where the owner stored, meticulously maintained, and sparingly drove his many cars. Okay. So his contention is the mileage really didn't go up because it was stored as part of a large collection, yet meticulously maintained. So we're going to go into the records and see if that, if that adds up, right? The other comment is the odometer functions perfectly, and you can see from the pictures that it's original. Well, actually, that photo doesn't tell us that. I mean, the photo tells us, yes, it has a correct 993 odometer. If you want to know it's original, pull it out. It's got a date stamp on the back, and the factory seals them with a little mark, and you could check, right? Not that that couldn't be faked or something. And I'm not accusing this guy of that in any way, but just that really doesn't answer the question, right? The next comment says, I will provide under, uh, under carpet trunk pictures shortly to show the condition of the metal. It's perfect, just like the rest of the body paint. Gives me a little pause. It's perfect like the rest of the body paint? Okay, but fair enough. Uh, I don't have access to a lift or a way to take off any underbody panels. I've never seen a drop of oil underneath the car, even when it sat for a week or two. Any 993 owners out here in the audience? Okay. The thing about 993 is they are prone to leak, and if you have the undertray on them, they won't leak on the ground because the undertray acts like a giant diaper underneath the car. Actually, one of the great things if you're ever inspecting a 993, it has the tray, pull it off, and if it looks perfectly clean, the seller's probably lying to you and cleaned it, but if it looks honest and it's got some pebbles and road debris, it'll also have oil leaks, new evidence on it. You'll pull it off and it'll hold, I'll bet you a half or a one quart before it starts spilling. I mean, it's, a, it's like an amazing little slosh pan under there. Okay, so I love to see that. I love to pull one off. Um, so again, I don't think he's being dishonest, but again, saying your car doesn't leak on the ground doesn't mean it's not leaking, right? A lot of other common 911 leaks leak onto the heat exchangers and they just burn off too. Okay, um, okay. Next comment is, there are also extensive pictures of paint meter readings from the front fenders and hood that verify the original paint depth and the areas that have had the PPF applied. Okay, okay, no comment, just that's what he's saying. And then the next comment says, when the car was two weeks old, the owner backed into a pylon in a garage. He filed with insurance saying something hit his car while parked only damage was to rear bumper, it was replaced by the dealer. Okay, so he's making, now he's made this claim twice, which is okay. Let's see if he has anything to substantiate that or that's just third-hand information. Okay, so what questions would I, you know, have, right? Well, a couple things. If I really dig into the service history that he has, one thing that he doesn't highlight that actually he should, he's selling himself short, is if you look at 39,000 miles, it essentially had a top-end rebuild at the dealer under warranty. 993s, there was a batch of them that had soft valve guides, and they would cause the check engine light to come on due to oil consumption, filling up the SAI passages. That would actually be a benefit he should be selling. In theory, it has 16,000 miles on a top-end rebuild. That's a benefit. He's missed that opportunity, right? So in his favor, he's actually underselling something. Um, where I get a little bit uh, uncomfortable is in the 11 of 2002, we knew it had 51,771 miles. 18 months later, it only had gone two miles, okay? Then I don't have a single other mileage report until 2020. So from 20, 2004 until 2020, so 16 years, right? It only went 353 miles. Now, that's certainly possible, right? But it, it arouses a little bit of suspicion, right? Again, not saying it's not true, but it's something that goes, okay. Because if you look at the Carfax, what I, want, what I don't know is on the ownership history, because the original owner was averaging 8,000 miles a year, all the way th for the first six years. You can see a pretty consistent pattern. And then they go to 353 miles in 18 years. So either it had an ownership change and it did go into a collection, Carfax doesn't show an ownership change, or there's something else, right? Okay. The other thing is, he talks about having service history back to 1997. Well, how complete is it? Well, if you actually dig into it, it has just six records in 24 years. Four of which were prior to 2002, and two of which are current. So that entire span that says the car was meticulously maintained, 
got no miles in a collection, there's no history. Again, it doesn't mean it's not true, but it means there's nothing to substantiate that, right? See how that works? Um, next, on the paint meter readings, remember that what he said is that the paint meter readings verify original paint. Well, here's what we have for the front hood. Now, these are with film, and a lot of people ask me the question, well, how do you meteor a car that has paint protection film? Paint protection film has a thickness. You can check with the manufacturer, but most products are between seven and eight mils. As a reference, five mils is the thickness of a dollar bill. An original paint 993 will generally show on the hood somewhere between four and six mils. Okay? So if it has original paint, you're really going to get a reading between 11 and maybe 13 mils. Okay? What he actually posts is 35.4 in one spot and 30.4 in another. So what this tells me is either he just doesn't know what the reading should be, like, because some people know I better put a paint meter reading, but not really knowing how to evaluate or read it. Interestingly enough, nobody in the audience said anything about this. It doesn't mean it's a bad car by any means, but it just is interesting. The contention is it has original paint on the hood, right? Yet the readings would tell you otherwise, right? Same with the right front fender, it's reading 15.85, right? Well, that's not indicative of original paint thickness either. So, again, something, right? It's not the end of the world, but it's something. Um, and the next thing we already talked about this, the accident, right? There's nothing posted in here that he has any substantive information. So my guess is what he has is when he purchased the car, he probably asked the question and they said, oh, yeah, the owner backed into a pole. And that could entirely be true. Or it could be not true. I mean, right? Um, the other thing is what would really help me is to expand on the ownership history. Because if, for example, Carfax shows it as two owners, and Carfax has lots of flaws. If you didn't know this, don't. You're not printing the Bible off what they've written in Carfax. Trust me on this one, okay? Uh, but Carfax says it's two owners. If it's two owners, then I'm really suspect about the mileage because a person who drives 8,000 miles a year for six years in a row doesn't then drive 353 miles for 18, right? But if it changed owners, I could see a totally different ownership pattern. The only thing that's suspicious to me is in 2002, when the car, in theory, changed owner to owner two, this wouldn't have been a collectible type of car, right? It wouldn't have been a car that somebody who's already had reasonable mileage, it would seem like a weird car to salt away in a collection, but, in, but possible, right? But we don't really know if that was owner two, because the other thing is owner two, it looks like never even registered the car. There's no history whatsoever. I mean, it's just, it's like ghosted for all that period of time. Um, so I would probably ask the seller, hey, do you have anything about the documentation who owned it between owner one and you? Or is it multiple people? I don't know, right? Let's look at a couple photos, a couple things that just kind of grabbed me, um, you know, underneath the car. Um, and again, we have no chassis photos. So what he's posted is just photos he's taken from the ground with the tray, with his, just his phone underneath. He's not really doing himself a service. I really can't see much of anything here. So this is what we have for chassis photos. So not enough information to really form an opinion. But what I find interesting is, yet he has photos of the rear suspension. So my guess is maybe he did this, I don't know. At some point he decided to photo this, but he can't photo the rest. I don't know, it's bizarre to me. Um, they also, I think it's actually funny, it says it has European lowering springs. No, it doesn't. It's got new Coney shocks, it's got Renline, uh, all the Renline bars here, so you've got your, uh, you know, it's got monoball mounts. So clearly the suspension's not original on this car, which is fine, right? In fact, 993 stock suspension, if you don't know, it's garbage. But um, he's in some ways selling himself short, but also not really being clear about what the offering is because this is very definitely not just springs, right? To me, he spent some money. This looks pretty relatively new. Um, so I would be highlighting that. But if I bought it and I thought I was getting an original car minus springs, I might be upset. So just things like this, you just want to look at. Um, you'll also notice it's got RS motor mounts in it too when you look at it. And then these are our paint meter readings. So this is that 35.4. I applaud him. He, he did put this information out there. But again, it's interesting. The claim is it's original, but the reading would not be indicative of that. Right? Um, this is the 15.85 on the right fender. And then again, this is the Carfax. And again, please, Carfax is so, do not rely on it. It's just one piece of data. But again, you can see in 2002, 51,771, and then 2004, it only went two miles. 
right? Possible, but more unusual. And then all of a sudden, nothing. And then when he bought the car, it had 52, well, 300 more miles than that, just over 52,000 miles. So, I mean, it's possible someone stored it away for some reason. Maybe they moved out of the country or something. We just don't know. There's nothing to back, back it up, okay? Okay. Feel pretty good about how we looked at uh, car number one? Okay, let's look at the next car. Uh, I wanted to pick another car similar just so we'd be in a kind of a similar genre. It's not that I only like 993s. Uh, this one's a 95. This car's kind of interesting. It's a what they call a ROW, a rest of world car. Yeah, it was originally intended for the German market. This seller purchased the car out of France recently. Interestingly enough, uh, five years ago, I could have exported every Porsche I ever had to Europe. Now the opposite's true. All my European buyers are calling me, please buy some cars, we're dying over here. Um, their market's nowhere near as strong as ours is. Uh, the euro and the dollar are about par for the first time in a long time. And so frankly, there are potentially are some, some buys there, um, but that's an even more market to be cautious with. So now we're starting to see a lot of sellers buying cars in Europe, bringing them over with the opportunity to capitalize on our market. No problem with that. Okay, again, let's look at the ad copy. What is, what is BAT telling us? It says, this 1995 Porsche 911 Carreras is a German market example that spent approximately two decades in France before it was brought to the US by the seller in December of 22. Well, right now there's about an eight week lead time on BAT. So essentially this car landed in the US and the guy listed it with BAT. Again, not a problem. It's a capitalistic society. I buy and sell cars, no issue, but it tells me I, he doesn't have a lot of time with this car, right? So he doesn't have a lot of information on it. Um, the other thing to know is, you know, we used to be real derogatory about when back in the 80s we had gray market cars. Um, I hate that period of time because I, I like rest of the world cars. The German market cars do have some cool things about them. They've got better gearing in the transmission, right? They have no secondary ear injection on their motors, so they have some cool things. Uh, they oftentimes will have some cooler specs in terms of you can find a non-sunroof car in Germany fairly easily, things like that. Um, so I'm not opposed to it, but it's just something I want to know about. The other thing that's kind of funny is, is BAT says, it has a clean Carfax report. <laughs> well, it showed up in December. <laughs> it's got eight weeks of history, right? If you didn't know it, Carfax does not report or get information out of the US, right? So it's just funny. Again, that just, it's their boilerplate. Oh, look at the Carfax, it's clean. Woohoo! eight weeks, good job. Um, next thing it says is, the car was finished from the factory in Adventure in Green Metallic L39S, and it was partially disassembled prior to a repaint in April of 22, when the windshield gaskets and weather seals were replaced. Okay, so a couple things that really catch my attention here. First off, it was done in April of 22, and then the car was immediately sold. So just like if someone's buying a house to flip, I always tell people, don't buy a flip house because the kind of person who's buying it to flip it, they don't really care if it works long term. It just has to look good in the open house, right? Same thing when people are, uh, not always, but it's just something you have to be careful of. Uh, it's different than it was someone's passion project and they said, oh, it's, gotta, it's gotta be the best, right? Um, but they also told us that, you know, all these gaskets and stuff were replaced. So, okay, let's dig, we're gonna wanna dig it in on this a little bit. Okay. So, my first thought on photos, I say pretty car, and I say the color, question mark, question mark. Anyone notice anything about the color on this car? The Venture in green's a great color, right? The thing I noticed immediately when I saw the photos is I was like, that is either not Adventure in green, or someone has altered these photos to make it a more desirable color. If you've ever had a venture in green, it's a very hard color to photo, in fairness to the seller. It's a hard color to capture, because it does sort of change colors depending on the lighting. But the color that's shown in those lead photos is nowhere indicative of what adventure in green should look like, okay? Very, very different than it really looks. So there's only one of two things. Either someone has photoshopped and altered or filtered the photos, which already arouses my suspicion, right? Because you want the car you're buying to look like the one you've bought online, or when it was painted, they didn't paint it the correct color. I mean, there's only two possibilities. Um, so we're gonna dig into that a little bit. And the photos are very sexy, right? That's the best way I put it. So a lot of times people get very caught up in the sex. There's a couple sellers on BAT that, man, even me, I mean, this is what I do for a living, and I see the picture, I'm like, whoa, that looks good. And then I'm like, stop, Nate. 
geez, this is all done in a photo box and they've all altered everything. No, don't be stupid. So we're going to look past the sex of the photos. Okay, so let's talk about audience questions. So someone says, are you able to post uh, more undercarriage photos? Bingo, great question, right? Oh, and comments of any oil leaks or pics? Any leak down test? Thanks again, right? So also good question. So our audience so far is doing pretty good. Then someone says, it is almost like European adventuring green metallic paint is greener than US models. <laughs> You know, I'm going to defer to Rolf here. Maybe he knows that, like, at the factory, they're like, they have, like, the bad area. They only paint the U.S. cars. They're like, ah, gives them the crappy paint. And in Europe, we'll get the good color. <laughs> really? Oh, my God, people, right? So then someone says, you know, tags this person. Says, I agree with you. This looks a lot greener than my American spec and venturing green metallic. These Germans, man, they're great. Okay. So... Then someone else says, I also own a Euro spec adventure in green, though mine has almost no options. I sit on cloth seats, which is cool. I can confirm that Euro adventure in green and US adventure in green are the same on 993s. We got some smart people here. Uh, I'm guessing it's just the photos here, though it would be a good idea for the seller to snap a few quick shots with, say, a smartphone just to confirm. Right? I'm liking this audience. They're scoring some points. I'm, I'm liking these to this audience. So what does our seller do? What is his response? And what do we think? Well, he says, undercarriage photo pics will show, uh, where we can notice. One other comment. I, my guess is the seller may not be English first language. So some of his responses are a little bit parsed, but I think it's that. Be my read on it. So it says, undercarriage pics where we can notice slight oil around usual suspects. Valve and chain tensioner cover. No leaks around main engine seal or gearbox. Dual ignition rotor has been serviced in 2013. That's really not important, 10 years later. Um, leak down or compression test has not been done, but engine is running perfectly well, smooth and strong. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next one, about the color. Yes, I agree, the adventure green color, green metallic looks very green on the pictures. I agree with this side, okay. This color is known to change with the light. The day of the shooting was cloudy, and the settings, settings of the photo, uh, photograph was probably different from mine uh, when I shot these photos a couple days before under a nice sun. On my pictures, the color looks like a mix of blue, uh, green, blue, and gray, which is accurate. Uh, you can also see the difference of photo settings on the seats that are more black and shiny on the pro photos. So, you know, I think he is trying to admit, like, maybe that something's happening with these photos. So let's, let's see what we think. Okay. So what questions or concerns would I have? Well, the first one, uh, why was the car a complete repaint? Well, it was done right before, we, not this gentleman, but whoever sold it to him was done. Uh, and if you look through the invoices, the cost to do the repaint was $8,500. Uh, where's Mr. Paderek back here? Is he hiding back there? No, I don't see him. Okay, he's high. he doesn't want to hear me talk. I bet you if you call Mr. Paderek, you probably can't get a 993 done for $8,500. Now, maybe in France, the pricing is different. I don't know, but it would be hard to get a quality job in the US for $8,500. Okay, so that's the first thing that sticks to my head, right? Now, the seller puts down its $14,000, but if you actually look at the invoice, a lot of that was other things. It was a new ECU and some stuff, but the paint itself was, the paint and gaskets was $8,500. Okay, um, the other thing is there's some fairly ugly corrosion under the car, which is indicative of life in Germany. If you don't know this, Germany, they still heavily salt their cars. And one thing I love about Germans, take a lesson from good Germans, they drive their flipping cars. You go there and they'll have their snow tires on and they're driving. I love it. Um, the other thing is there's, there's a fair amount of, of uh, damage under the front bumper, even though it's only gone a few hundred miles since that was all, in theory, repainted. So whoever had it wasn't super careful with it in just a few hundred miles. And we do have some oil leaks we'll see in the photos. So let's, let's drill into some of these photos here. Okay, this is that super sexy photo. I mean, I look at this car, and this is a, this is a good looking car. I mean, I look at this thing, and I go, damn, I want to buy it. If you know anything about 993s, you know they really didn't have a color like this. Um, but man, does it look good. And again, so my thought is, well, either it's a filter, or something's been edited on the photo, um, or they repainted it the wrong color. What's a little bit telling to me is, look how green the rear background is. Someone's amped up. Which, right? It's winter time and they've taken a photo. And so uh, the other thing is you'll see stuff like, look at the reflections on the glass, see how green it is? Someone's amped up the color. Um, 
Now this is his, so this is really telling, right? This is just snapped with his smartphone. This is the correct adventure in green color if you don't know the color. Well, I hate to say it because I like adventure in green. This is a way sexier car. <laughs> this is the car you're buying. This is the one your emotion's buying, right? So just be really, really careful. Uh, and I'm not saying someone's doing something nefarious. Sometimes you'll hire a photographer and they think they're doing you a service, right? They're like, oh, it'll look better. The way I look at pictures is they, you, you should have you know, one or two that are kind of your sex draw the people in photo, but your other photo should be sort of documentary. This is actually what will come to your house if you buy it. Or in my case, you follow my recommendation, the one you see when you go inspect it. <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, other little things, I, I'm a big fan of the big screen and I like to zoom in, so don't do it on your phone, right? So this is the driver's side quarter window and just little things I see in paint prep stuff, right? Paint's already sort of peeling here. Um, obviously this wasn't a windows out here. Um, again, it's not, a, it's not a horrible thing, but it's just, it's something to know. Uh, same thing here, you'll notice this is under the front bumper cover and this is just overspray and kind of the wet sanding dust. Have you ever done any paint work that's on all the... So this was just a quick job, right? This wasn't a real... Again, not the worst thing in the world, but just something to, to have some awareness on. This is just because zooming in. It's hard to find this stuff just looking on your phone. Um, other stuff, you can tell they did all the jams. You can see they painted around all the stickers and the jams. Again, not a problem, but it's just... Frankly, usually when people do an exterior respray, they don't do the jams and stuff. So I might have some, some questions around that. The other question is, why did it need to be done in the first place? Uh, my guess is the exterior of the car looked more akin to what the underneath looks like. Just honest, I mean, probably just driven. Um, now, again, 300 miles ago, the whole thing was repainted, but you can already see the significant damage on the bumper cover underneath. So someone clearly wasn't particularly careful with it. I mean, it could have been when they shipped it too, but... Um, and then, you know, a fair amount of impact damage in the front trunk. Not the end of the world. Those picky of us know it's missing its little drain plugs. Um, and you can see stuff like this. All those little pieces in the factory are black trim. They're not painted over, but they're painted over uh, in this example. No, that's just a uh, little bit of a mix of cosmoline and, yeah, and life, I guess. Um, now, this is a photo, and it's really, this is one of some of the first ones he posted. Uh, but this is actually the rear under tray. I've never seen an under tray look that disintegrated. It's like an ABS plastic piece, but it's, I, it's bizarre. Um, but you can just see how much rust and stuff. And now, in fairness, Porsches are very well galvanized. They can, believe it or not, they can drive in bad roads and solve this off fine. Um, doesn't mean the car wouldn't hold up. But I personally would be less than thrilled to have a car that looks like this underneath. Because um, if you're going to work on this car, you're going to have a torch and you're going to be doing a lot of cussing. I don't want to cuss. So uh, again, you have this super sexy, uh, to me it's an interesting juxtaposition if you go to this, right? Ah. <laughs> to this, right? Again, it doesn't make it a bad car, but it's, it's, it's a kind of two different things, right? Um, and again, this is, you know, from the other angle, you can see how and then just a little stuff, like you can already see the bumper cover on the back's all scraped up, and then they, all that trim that should be black is just sprayed green too. Um, again, just probably not a, a job done to a, to a significant level. So what I want to do is I want to leave a little bit of time so we can ask some questions and stuff. If you want to know how to find me, this is how you can find me if you have any particular questions. So I think we have probably, what, 10 minutes? Can we take one question from online? We absolutely, you're the boss here, Vu. So, so Mama Mohammed said, what do we do with auctions if we want to get the cars inspected? Ah, so that's a great question. So a lot of people say, well, Nate, I can't inspect the car. Well, actually you can. Here's the answer. Let's say you just by happenstance don't see it and the auction ends in four hours, then you're just out. You don't, you don't bid on the car. You don't have time to make an educated decision, okay? Give you an example. This is non-Porsche, but one of my favorite cars. If you don't haven't ever owned one, they're terrible cars. So I don't want anyone driving with the value. But God Himself dropped the 2004 Volkswagen R32 from the heavens. It is, oh my God, I love that car. And I have one. It's kind of my everyday beater. And one just popped up on Bring a Trail that has 97 miles on it. 97. So I'm like, I'm giving my left arm for this car. 
this car is 87 miles north of here in New York. What are the odds I would be that close? So, actually not tonight, but probably Sunday night before I fly out on Monday morning, I think I'm driving north and I'm going to go lay hands on that car. Because if I'm going to put out a lot of money for that car, it's probably what it's supposed to be. But why would I not, right? Uh, I, for example, I bought a 964 RS. You can see it on my profile. I flew to Chicago. Was it convenient to fly to Chicago for the day? No. Did I learn a lot about the car? Yes. Did it cost me a thousand bucks to do it? Yes. What would it have cost me to buy a $350,000 car that was the wrong car? I guarantee more than a thousand bucks. So if you want to buy it and don't inspect it, then don't complain about it. That's fine, right? Right. But again, if you if you can't do it, then you just can't do it, right? Um, you know, one of the other things you can do, the PCA, one of the best benefits about the PCA is you pick up your phone, right? You go online, you go, oh, the president of the region of Chicago is this guy. You pick up your phone, you call him and say, hey. And magically, he'll be like, well, I don't know anything about 964s, but my vice president's got four of them, and he loves them. And next thing you know, he's going to go look at it for you. At least you have a real person to go lay eyes on, right? You'll get a data point. Use your Porsche Club. So there's my answer for that one. Thank you. Next question. Okay, so we're going back to the beautiful uh, shot. Okay. If you look through the glass of the cabin, it's tinted the same blue that they added to the bottom to change the color. Yes. What word? No. Yeah. And again, I, I don't necessarily attribute this to the seller being nefarious. A lot of times, like, they hire a photographer, and the photographer thinks they're doing you a favor because they're looking at it as, like, art. Like, I got to make the car look a certain way, and not looking at it as, your job as a seller is to document what's actually there. So I don't, I mean, it could be the seller being dishonest, but I actually tend to give them the benefit of the doubt. The photographer gets carried away. So just for those that are watching online, the key that people pointed out was the glass in this photo is a little bit more blue or green yep. than it naturally should, which would add color to the car. Yep. Next question. Do, oh, do the online auctions do anything to monitor shill bidding? Um, in theory, yes. Um, in theory, they, they watch for certain patterns, and they've got, in theory, software. I don't, I don't actually know how it all works. I do know that they, they have that out there. But here's my take on it. Shill bidding happened in auctions in Greece. I mean, it happened thousands of years ago. Shill bidding is a thing in auctions, and if you don't think it's a thing, you're a fool, right? The way I look at it is, as terrible as this sounds, it doesn't bother me in the least. And that's not a popular opinion. Here's why it doesn't bother me in the least. A car or an asset or whatever it is that you're selling an auction is worth a certain somebody. And whoever you as a buyer is, it's worth a certain amount to you. And if you don't have the self-discipline or whatever to stick to your number, like, we'll see what happens on this R32. Please, nobody bid against me. <laughs> um, but I have a number in my head. And I write it down. And I bid. And if I reach beyond my bid, I stop bidding. Well, if, if a shill drove me to that number, it doesn't matter. I was willing to pay that. And if I'm the fool and I go pay 50 grand more than I committed to, well, that's on me, right? So yes, the answer is they try to stop it. I think the reality is you're not going to be able to. Uh, it's just too unregulated. It's too easy to call a buddy in Boston and say, hey. Yeah, so. Question in the back, Rico. So the question was, the rusty exhaust that we saw, if the seller took the time to do dry ice on it, cleaned it up, does that make a difference for you? It's a great question, and actually I could do a whole tech session on dry ice, but essentially the thing to know about dry ice is dry ice uncovers what's there. It doesn't refinish, replate, make it better, it just exposes what's underneath the grime, the cosmoline, the oil, whatever, right? So, for example, if your fasteners are rusty and they're covered with grime, when you dry ice them, the rusters are just clean but rusty, right? And I tell that because sometimes people watch that video and they see a perfect car and they're like, man, my 200,000 mile car is going to look like that that lived its whole life in Boston. 
No, it won't. <laughs> It'll look like a cleaner, rustier version, right? So, uh, you know, if you want to solve that, you'd end up replacing a lot of stuff um, to solve some of that corrosion type stuff. Hundred percent. So the question oh, yeah. is: There's a lot of research that you're doing with uh, cars that are online. Do you do the same amount of research for cars that are being offered CPO at a dealer? One hundred percent. And I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of us want to have a feel good that you know a Porsche store has you know blessed it with its CPO. Well, the thing to know about Porsche stores is they're like anything else. They're a franchise, and they're only as good as their ownership group and their leadership, right? So Porsche does a great job. I mean, the standards of CPO are very high, and they've got a checklist, and they basically say, in order for a car to be CPO, it has to meet this standard, and on certain things, certain things kick it out, like it cannot be certified if it doesn't meet this standard, or if you want to certify it, you have to bring up to par, for example, the tires have to be end spec, and the brakes have to be more than 50%, right? So on paper, the system is perfect. The problem is it's implemented by people, right? So if you have a really good leader, you know, good ownership group, and they're really committed to making sure they only sell the best cars, they'll generally be fine. But it's like any other thing. You have profit motive in there. So a dealer gets a car, comes back on lease return, and it's a little edgy, right? So inspect what you expect. Um, but yeah, again, it's a good program. It's just how it's implemented. Uh, I highly recommend CPO cars, but just go lay eyes on them. So the question is, is it all worthwhile to try to buy something online? Because you might be looking at it with you know, very prescriptive eyes, and then others are just goo goo ga ga, and you know, they pay a ridiculous amount for something that might sh shouldn't be that high. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I think I, I profess a concept I call platform agnostic, meaning that I'll buy cars off any platform. I, I don't have an affinity. You know, a lot of people say, oh, don't buy it on eBay, that's uh, dirty. And, Craigslist scammy, right? You know, bring a trailer, good, you know. Um, I'm platform agnostic. You can find good cars in good places and bad cars in bad places and vice versa, right? So, but that just goes back to being a disciplined buyer. So if you're looking to buy wherever, wherever platform is, be disciplined, take the time, do your due diligence, set a budget and say, hey, I like this car, here are the problems I see, here's what it's worth to me. And because I do see cars on there that a lot of people only remember the cars that sold for too much. Every so often I do see cars that I think, you know, uh, usually what happens, your best deals on there is we have a, you have a really good, honest seller who's not market savvy and they take bad photos and, right, they kind of do themselves a disservice. Sometimes you'll find deals like that. So if anything, sometimes I pay attention to the ones with bad photos because sometimes underneath the bad photos you can actually see it's actually a good car that someone took at noon with their flip phone with them reflected in the side of it and they got dinner on the seat and you're like, killing yourself here, right? Question right there. So the question is, is there any recourse if something is grossly misrepresented, you bought the car, lands on your driveway, and it's not what they said it was? Yeah. So, yes. I mean, you're generally in an environment where essentially one of the online auctions companies, not just BAT, but an online auction company, views themselves really as just the advertising medium. And this is the distancing language. They're, they're not, they view themselves as not party to the transaction. So if you purchase the car, uh, your beef isn't with the online auction company, it's with the seller. And as private individuals, depends on the state, but for the most part, you're pretty hung to dry, unfortunately.
Wow. Can you, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. He wants to know just kind of my overall thoughts with the general Porsche market. Um, we only have a few more minutes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I do like hour-long presentations just about the market, but a couple of my global thoughts are that, uh, one, buy a car because you love it, and then whatever happens in value is just kind of interesting. For many years, we all bought cars, and we never had this expectation that they were going to go up in value. The example I use, if, if my wife and I go on a great vacation, when I'm done with my vacation, I have less money than I did when I started, but I had an experience. Good experiences cost good money, right? We have this weird idea now, we can buy a Porsche and have this great experience, and then we're done, it'll be worth more. Woo! Life doesn't really work that way, right? So if you enjoy the car and you like it, buy it. That's, that's thought one. Um, in terms of what the overall market's gonna do, uh, I think very, very late model Porsche is gonna move more to a traditional model, which it's followed. You know, you know would I think it'd be smart to be buying new, new late model GT cars and paying $150,000 over sticker? Generally, no. Um, do I think they're going to drop $200,000 in six weeks? No. But do I think it's, gonna, it's cooling down? Yes. Uh, on the classic and collectible market, the truly exceptional cars are fairly insulated. The cars that are exposed are the ones that are being hyped as exceptional that are really just meh. And that's a lot of the cars that have been sold lately. Those cars could, can cool slightly, and you're going to see a, a greater distance between truly exceptional and uh, meh, right? Because there's always people with money in the world, no matter what happens up or down or sideways, that won't compromise, but they have more options when the market cools down. They say, well, I'm not gonna compromise, I'm only gonna buy the best, and I'll pay for it. It's the person in the middle that kind of gets squeezed, and that's kind of what we're gonna see. Um, but personally, I'd love the market to cool down because I'd just buy more cars. <laughs> so if you guys all sell your cars, that's great. There you go. All right, so with that, we're gonna end this episode. Thank you for joining us for Tech Tactics Live. We have another one that's going to be on at 2.30. So you're here for a couple of hours this Bobby. afternoon. Yep. You're here tomorrow for the others. But uh, take advantage of having Nathan here. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Boo.